Good afternoon, class. We are looking at uh, exam four review covering chapters four and five from section 4.4 to 5.4. 4.4 optimization problems, 4.6 antiderivatives, 5.1 to 5.3 the fundamental theorem of calculus, and 5.4 the substitution rule. Here's some of uh, basic integration formulas you're all familiar with. FTC, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, we have two of them. One of them says the derivative of the integral, they cancel each other and they give us the function back. If you take the integral of a to x, f of t dt, and then take the derivative of that with respect to x, you get f of x. Also, definite integral, which is a number, the definite integral of a to b f of x dx, you can use the Riemann sum and the limit or the easy way out, capital F of B minus F of A, capital F of A, where capital F prime is lowercase F of X. The substitution rule was also discussed, the integral of F of G of X times G prime of X dx, where G of X uses the U substitution, and therefore G prime of X times dx is the U, is the integral of F of U, the U, and that's known as the substitution rule. Now, example one is about section 4.4 optimization. We want to find two, for example, we want to find two numbers whose sum is 54 and whose product is a maximum. I'm going to look at a couple of examples and I'm going to do one of them. The first thing I want to explain is that when we do the first or second derivative test, that gives us a local max or local mean. However, if we have an open interval with only one critical point, local becomes absolute. That is the absolute extrema. So a local extremum is an absolute one if it is the one and only uh, one and only extremum in an open interval. So in this case, if the numbers are x and y, the objective is to maximize the product x times y. And the constraint is that the sum x plus y must be 50. Here's another example. If 5,400 pi square inches of metal is used to construct a cylindrical storage drum, what is the maximum possible volume? So here's the shape of a cil cylinder and the volume that we want to maximize is pi r squared h. The restriction is this much material we have. That means gift wrapping. That means surface area. The area of the bottom, which is in the shape of a circle, is pi r squared, with the top that makes 2 times pi r squared. And the lateral surface, if you cut this open, we have the height times the width or length, if you want to call it. The length or width would be the circumference, circumference or 2 pi r for the base. So it becomes 2 pi r h. Therefore, the surface area is 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h, and it's equal to 5,400 pi. This is a function of two variables, r and h. You solve for h here, you put it in here, and you finish the job. This is the actual question we're going to do. A farmer wants to fence a rectangular field beside a river with 2,400 feet of fencing. The river itself will be one of the four sides. What dimensions will give the largest area. You have to draw setting. You have to define your variables. X is the width, Y is the length. So you want to maximize the area, which is X times Y. And the parameter is normally 2X plus 2Y. In this case, this side doesn't need it. So 2X plus Y is equal to 2400. This is the uh, given. And since A has two variables, you use the constraint and solve for y. You put it into a and it becomes a function of one variable, namely x. And x is between 0 and 1,200 for a simple reason. x, the dimension, must be positive. If you choose it to be 1,200, in other words, if you set this one equal to 0, x becomes 1,200. Then one side, namely y, becomes 0. The area becomes 0. And if you uh, pick it to be larger than that, 
this side becomes negative, therefore, 0 to 1,200. You multiply them through, you get 2,400x minus 2x squared. To uh, find a critical point or points, you find a prime of x, which is 2,400 minus 4x. You set this equal to 0, and x becomes 600. So we have an upper open interval of 0 to 1200 with only one critical point, local becomes absolute. If it's a local max, it's an absolute max. If it's a local mean, it's an absolute mean. So to find which one is the case, we're gonna go with the second derivative test, a double prime is negative for any time. The second derivative is just a number, it makes life easier. That means it's always negative. That means it's concave down looking like this and therefore the maximum occurs when x is 600. So what is y? You can use this formula or this formula and y becomes 1200 feet. What is the maximum area? The product of the two numbers, which makes it 720,000 square feet. Example two, from a thin piece of cardboard, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters square corners are cut out so that the sides can be folded up to make a box. What dimensions will yield a box of maximum volume? What is the maximum volume? So you have a 10 by 10 thin piece of cardboard. And when you cut out X amount, since you cut out X amount here, there is 10 minus X, another X then that makes this piece 10 minus 2X. You fold it up into uh, a box. The height is X, the width and length length are both 10 minus 2x. So you want to maximize the volume of a rectangular solid, which is length times the width times the height. And you know the height is x, the width and the length are both the same, 10 minus 2x. If we replace this with what we just mentioned, the volume becomes a function of x, x times 10 minus 2x quantity squared. And x must be between 0 and 5. Why is that? You're cutting x amount. If x is 0, first of all, x is a dimension can't be negative. If x is 0, you're not cutting anything. You're not creating any box. If x is 5, if you set this one equal to 0, x becomes 5 and one side becomes zero, the volume becomes zero. So in essence, you have 10, you cut it in half, there is nothing, there is no box as a result. There is no three dimensional to be made. And so we're gonna raise this to the power of two. This one gives you 100. Then the product of these two minus 20 X times two makes it minus 40 X. Then you square this one, you get four X squared. You distribute the X, you get 100 X minus 4dx squared plus 4x cubed. You put it in descending order, 4x cubed comes first as the leading term. We are going to differentiate and set it equal to zero to find CPs or critical points. So V prime or V prime of x is 12x squared minus 80x plus 100. You see a common factor of 12 minus 80 and 100. You, you see the coefficients of 12 minus 80 and 100 giving a com common factor of four. This gives you three X squared. This gives you minus 20 X. This gives you 25 when you take out the four. Because this number is a prime number, three is one and three. It's an easy factoring as follows. This part only. So four times you have x, you have 3x, 
because three is a prime number. 25, you have to go with one and 25 or five and five. Since this is positive, both must have the same sign. Since this is negative, both must be negative. Notice you have minus 5x here, minus 15x. They do add up to negative 20x. If you set this equal to 0, you get x equals 5 thirds, x equals 5. And as we mentioned here, x can't be 5. You're going to get rid of 5. So what happens is we have an open interval of 0, 5 with only one critical point in between. So local becomes absolute, whether you do the first or the second derivative test. It's easier to go with the second derivative test. 12x squared becomes 24x minus 80x becomes minus 80. That's P double prime. According to the second derivative test, you have to plug in your critical point to see whether you get a positive or negative value. When we do that, 24 times 5 thirds minus 80, we get the following. Eight times five, 40 minus 80 is negative 40. Again, it doesn't matter uh, negative what number, the sign is important, makes it concave down. That means maximum because it looks like that occurs when x is 5 thirds. So if x is 5 thirds, what is the width? What is the length? 10 minus 2 times that. Since this is minus 10 thirds, then we change the 10 to 30 thirds. So we get 20 thirds. The dimensions are 5 thirds by 20 thirds by 20 thirds. And this is an easy product. 5 times 20, 100 times 20 is 2,000. 3 cubed is 27. So 2,000 over 27 or 74 and 2 over 27 cubic centimeters over the cubic centimeters. Example three, find all functions g such that g prime of x is four sine x plus two x to the power of five minus square root of x over x. And the idea is to integrate, to find the antiderivative. So here's the process. Sometimes you will need to simplify first, factor, cancel, remove a radical notation, etc. Sometimes you will need to integrate using substitution. So that's how the process goes. So with that being the case, we are going to make up two fractions here. So this is easy to x to the power of four. This one, we have to change the square root of x to x to the power of one half. Remember the exponent is one here when we don't have it, x to the power of one. So this becomes minus x to the power of one half minus one, which makes it negative one half. Now it's ready to be integrated. To integrate uh, this, we're going to say g of x is equal to the integral of the right side times dx. Uh, the derivative of sine is uh, cosine, but the integral is minus cosine. So this gives us negative four cosine x. Uh, these two use the power rule. So two over five x to the power of five minus one over negative one half plus one x to the power of negative one half plus one and a constant. Negative one half plus one is one half. And this is two, so minus two. And we rewrite it. So the final answer is g of x is minus four cosine x plus two fifth x to the power of five minus two square root of x plus the constant c.
to integrate uh, or differentiate for that matter, you have to do it term by term. So this uses the power rule. So two over five X to the power of five, uh, three over four X to the power of four, uh, minus seven thirds X cubed. Remember the exponent is one when we don't have it. So one half X squared, finally minus five X plus a constant. The integral of x minus 5 quantity squared dx. First, we raise this to the power of 2x squared minus 10x plus 25. That's the easy identity we should remember. So 1 over 3x cubed minus 10 divided by 2. Remember, when we don't have an exponent, the exponent is 1. So 1 and 1 is 2 minus 10 halves, meaning minus 5x squared. Finally, 25x and a constant. When we differentiate exponential, we multiply by four. When we integrate, we divide by four because of this the reverse process. So the answer is itself divided by four. So one fourth e to the power of four x plus a constant. In this case, the same thing, e to the power minus three x we divide by negative three, so negative one third e to the power minus three x and a constant. In this case, you should recognize that this means half of x. And so you're dividing by one half. So the answer is one over one half. And the same thing, e to the power of x over two, and a constant. This is true. Two over x is the product of two and one over x. If you know that, you don't have to write it, but it helps to write it in this fashion if you want to explain it to someone, because you know this, the answer is a natural log. So two times, ln of absolute value of x and a constant. Uh, same thing happens here. If you recognize it, so be it. If not, write it as one half times one over x. And therefore, it's the same as this one. Instead of two, we have one half in front. One half ln of absolute value of x plus a constant. Definite integral results in a number. So you integrate this, you get one over eight x to the power of eight. You know, you don't need a constant from zero to one. You plug in one, this becomes one. You plug in zero, this becomes zero. The answer is one over eight times one minus zero or one over eight. The tip is, even if you use a constant, even if you use another antiderivative capital F of x plus C in the evaluation theorem, the result will be the same because we're gonna write capital F of B plus C minus the brackets capital F of A plus C, those, this is plus C, this is minus C, they cancel each other, we get F of B minus F of A. So even if I put a constant here, it makes no difference. And to integrate this, I hope everybody by now knows that of course, X to the power of minus one is the same as one over X. Therefore, the answer is a natural law. And we're gonna go from one to two. Now, whether I put the absolute value or not makes no difference because both limits, one and two are positive. And we should know ln one is zero. So we get ln two as an exact answer. 
Now the next part is the same thing. The difference is we have different limits. We must keep it with an absolute value. Why is that? Because when you plug in ln of, if you don't have an absolute value, ln of negative number makes no sense. They don't exist because the domain is from zero to infinity. So this becomes ln one minus ln two. Ln one is zero. So negative ln two is the exact answer. The derivative of sine is cosine, but the integral of that is negative cosine x from zero to pi. To evaluate this, it's probably easier if you keep this negative outside and say cosine of pi minus cosine of zero with the negative outside. Cosine of pi, you should know it's minus one, minus. Cosine of zero, you should know it's positive one. So this is negative two, the negative outside makes it positive two. To integrate this, we cut it into three fractions. This is one, this one is negative seven over x. This one is two over x squared. And to make sure the second and the third part can be easily recognized, we're gonna write minus seven over x as minus seven times one over x and two over x squared as two x to the power minus two. So one gives you x. Minus seven times one over X gives you minus seven, natural log of absolute value of X. This one gives you two over negative two plus one, X to the power of negative two plus one. Negative two plus one is negative one. So two over that is minus two x to the power of minus one. And we change that to negative two over x and a constant. Notice your independent variable is t, so one gives you t. Cosine, the derivative is negative, but the integral is positive sine t. Secant squared, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, so minus tan x and a constant. So in this case, minus tan t because the independent variable is t minus tan t and it comes. The cube root of x minus sine x dx, you are going to change this so that the power rule can be used, x to the power of one third. Using the power rule, one over one third plus one x to the power of one third plus one. Uh, minus sine x, gives you minus negative cosine x, or you can say plus cosine x and a constant. Remember sine gives you negative cosine when you are integrated. So I'm gonna put minus minus, so it becomes plus. I wanna discuss this one. We have four thirds here, four thirds here. And this reciprocal of four thirds gives you three fourths. And we can rewrite it in this format. 3 fourths cube root of x to the power of 4 plus cosine x and a constant is the final answer. Initial value problems. dv dt is e to the power of negative t times 1 plus e to the power of 2t. v of 0 equals 3. This is a pair 0 comma 3. 
So if we didn't have this, would be like previous examples, very simple. So what is an initial value problem? Any equation containing a derivative is called a differential equation or D. A function which satisfies the equation is called solution to the differential equation. An initial value problem is a differential equation along with a specified value of an unknown function called the initial condition. So when you look at this function, dv dt, dv is the right side times dt. We integrate both sides and this results in v of t. What about this one? Remember, exponential is itself. You have to divide by negative one, makes it minus e to the power of negative t. This is itself and a constant. So this is a general solution class. Uh, indefinite integral, infinitely many solutions. This is a family of functions. In other words, if you look at the graph of this function, this plus C makes it go up and down along the Y axis. So if there are infinitely many solutions. We would be done if we didn't have this. Since we have this, we can find the value of C. This means the pair zero comma three. That means replace the t with zero and v of t or y, if you will, becomes three. And as you know, e to the power of zero is one. So this becomes negative one, negative one and positive one cancel each other and c becomes three. And now replace it. So a general solution, a family of functions, infinitely many solutions because of one pair goes to one solution and only one known as a particular solution. General solution with a constant, particular solutions. We have infinitely many solutions, a family of functions here. We have only one solution. We want to integrate uh, the integral of 2x times x squared plus 5 to the power of 30 times dx, and we are using the substitution method. Here's the tip. Look for a function u equals g of x anywhere in the integrand, and its derivative du or g prime of x multiplied by dx. What you should notice is that we are dealing with a bunch of polynomials. Therefore, the more complicated one, namely x squared plus 5, is the choice of u. And if I differentiate that, everybody, I get du dx equals 2x. Therefore, du is 2x dx. And to make it clear what we are doing, we're going to put the 2x next to dx because they're all being multiplied by each other. This is u to the power of 30. This is du, so you're looking at u, and this is du, so you have u to the power of 30, du, and it uses the simple case of a power rule, therefore 1 over 31, u to the power of 31, and a constant is the answer. Reverse the substitution. 1 over 31x squared plus 5 to the power of 31, and a constant is the final answer. I want you to see these uh, questions side by side, the integration so you can compare and contrast. Uh, those are rational functions, but even if they are not, and they are simply fractional functions, you have to put them in lowest term if possible. Uh, see if you can factor this. This is number two, which is a prime number. This is number three, which is a prime number. And it makes it fairly simple because uh, two is simply one. That means one X. 
and two, that means two X. And three is one times three because we have negative three, one of them must be negative, one of them must be positive. So if I put a negative one here, and, and you can do a trial and error. I hope you see that this gives us negative two X. And this gives us three X. And the sum of these two give us the middle term. So I can replace this with X minus one times two X plus three. However, the only way I can simplify if I have one of those factors up here, I don't, no need to do that. So a fractional format, a rational format, the denominator is a choice of you. It's, <coughs> it's derivative or du dx is 4x plus 1. So du is 4x plus 1 dx. dx always belongs to the numerator. So I'm going to put it next to the numerator so it becomes clear that this is du over u. And we are looking at this case, the natural log. So the answer is natural log of absolute value of u and a constant uh, reverse substitution, replace the u and you get natural log of absolute value of two x squared plus x minus three plus a constant. We keep the absolute value because this expression can be positive or negative. And how do we know, th know that? I hope you remember from algebra, you calculate because this is quadratic, you calculate b squared minus 4ac. If it's negative, it has the same sign as the leading coefficient. If it's positive, then sometimes the expression is positive, sometimes it's negative. Now, so we couldn't simplify this one. However, this one, since the numerator is four times x minus one, it can be simplified. So you must simplify before you move on. So the very first step is algebraic step. Factor the numerator into four times x minus one, factor the denominator into two x plus three times x minus one. Drop the common factor. U is the denominator now, two x plus three. And du is two times dx. And I hope you recognize these two are together four dx, but du is only two dx. So it's not a big deal. Just write four as two times two. So two times two is four. So we are not changing anything. The only reason I'm writing in, in this fashion, so you can clearly see the du at top, u at the bottom, and there's a factor of two in front. So this is identical to this. We get the same answer with the two in front. And u is replaced. This is a reverse substitution. The final answer is two ln of absolute value of 2x plus 3 plus 3. And we are done. And again, we need the absolute value sign because uh, the expression 2x plus 3 can be positive or negative. So seeing the two questions side by side is truly helpful. What I want to do, I want to look at the reciprocal of this, which becomes the reciprocal of this. I don't have to go through the process. I've done that. The point is there is a common factor of X minus one, you drop it. So what is the difference now? The difference is if you make up two fractions, this gives you half of X. This gives you three fourths. And we don't need substitution. So the difference between the two is after this is simplified, you must go through the substitution. After this is simplified, you don't have to remember. When there's no exponent, the exponent is one. So you add one to it becomes two. One half divided by two is one fourth x squared plus three fourths x and a constant and you're done. This is the final answer. So it's good to see all those three side by side so you can compare and contrast.